Welcome back to another episode of the Corporate Cowboys Podcast. My name is Alex, your host. Today, proof of life. Today is Thursday, December 15, 2022. And in today's episode, this one's going to be pretty much open form, I want to say. The prompt that we have ahead of us actually asks, um, well, it's coming from r slash career guidance. And the question is, rather general in that it asks to those who have quit their jobs because of quote unquote toxic work environment what are the signs essentially this person is asking what are the signs to look out for of a toxic work environment of an environment you might be incentivized to leave to exit as soon as possible. They've uh, flared it with something called coworkers. I'm assuming it's because they would like folks to talk about working with coworkers, working in these environments that turn out to be toxic. So the body says as such, uh, can you give, it actually has a carrot pointing up, Can you give concrete examples, please? So they want concrete examples of a toxic work environment. And then it says, for context, I'm trying to decide if I am at, if, if I am the problem or the workplace and their location is Western Europe. Well, even though they live in a different country on a different continent, in a different society with different, potentially different cultural norms. I feel like a lot of the principles for employment, a lot of the principles for professionalism remain the same across the board. That being said, I think the first, I think the most immediate, the most obvious signs of a toxic work environment are going to be insufficient compensation, not being paid enough. Now, that could come back to the employee not having negotiated their worth and having signed onto whatever figure was just thrown at them at the initial offer. But it could also be that they're being paid below market value and that that stress, that um, insufficiency is compounding in the real life, outside of work. And they're having trouble, I don't know, feeding themselves, clothing themselves. But that's not so much a toxic work environment at work, is it? It's more, it's more a condition of work because you're being compensated for it, even if it is not enough. I think the most immediate that folks think about is, is an inept manager, a a manager who micromanages others, who doesn't let others work, who doesn't let others be productive. I think that comes to, to mind almost immediately. And we just done an episode on that where, um, I believe it was uh, just just the last episode. If you want to take a look at it, if you're interested, that would be season six, episode 19. What is my reason for leaving work after two months, right? And then that one, they also go on about how their manager is potentially micromanaging them. and, And, you know, there's just a lack of communication all around. But this question isn't necessarily providing us with an issue, but asking us how to identify these issues. Now, if I had them in front of me, again, if we're treating this like a consult and you're getting 30 minutes for free because this is, a, this is just a throwaway question. Um, we're taking their question at face value and just given very broad, very general concepts signs to look for you could also find if there's 
some form of uh, informal, some kind of informal hierarchy. If there are favorites between management and the staff, that might be impacting the way you do your job because you could be doing your job effectively and somebody else could be less competent than you are and yet still you are treated or compensated the same or rewarded in the same way or the other person might be rewarded more but that might be because of an extra professional relationship maybe they treat each other as friends or favorites which is kind of why I don't believe in having friends at work because it can skew your judgment on what productivity actually looks like. And you'll do so for the sake of what? Friendship, for the sake of feeling, for the sake of emotional bond. And in doing so, you're fucking up business. You're not looking after business. But it happens. It does happen. I've been in that position before. I've actually, um, I've actually worked with someone who had to let a friend go. And they gave me a story. They worked together for almost five years, worked together. This person was my immediate manager. And I had been working with them with, for some time. And we had some rapport together and we were able to, uh, to speak somewhat openly. I wouldn't say we were outright friends at the time. We've gotten closer since we parted ways. But I think that's in the nature of how life works, not so much our job. Because for all intents for all for all intents of purposes, he could have fired me. Right? But I knew this man to be a consummate professional. And would have done so if I was fucking up productivity for him. If I was holding the team back, so to speak. And he told me that he and his friend, after graduating high school, went into a company and worked together. They applied together. They got hired together, trained together, and worked together. And over time began to uh, accumulate merits, right? Accumulate points toward promotion, I would imagine, toward bonuses even, right? But it was my manager who would get promoted first. Now, I don't know because I wasn't there if this, for whatever reason, weighed heavily on his friend and that they didn't even try. He didn't put forth the same amount of effort that he did when they were both subordinates at a subordinate level. Right. But he noticed that his work began to drag. And even though they were friends and he did cut him some slack, he noticed That after a while, this cutting of slack began to look like had the appearance of favoritism to the detriment of the company, to the detriment of other employees, other subordinates below him. And he didn't want that. That's not the image he wanted to carry. He was a consummate professional, actively working on developing himself as a professional. Of course, he did what he could to coach his friend. But I'll say again, I wasn't there. I don't know how the friend took it. You know, humans are weird. Humans are weird. Sometimes they are grateful and sometimes they are not. Sometimes they are gracious. Sometimes they are not. This could have been one of those situations where if my supervisor was attempting to coach his friend to revitalize his friend's work ethic 
his friend might have taken it the wrong way, might have interpreted it as my manager preaching to him from a high horse. I've been there before, but I'm not using my story. I'm using my manager's story. <laughs> Mine will be for a different episode. I just want to let you know that I've got stories on stories, and I've got stories from others, folks that I've worked with, folks that I've worked for. Now, his friend might have taken it the wrong way, that he's belittling him in some way, that he's berating him in some way. Again, I wasn't there. I don't know if this was in public, in front of others. But knowing my manager, I would imagine it was. It could have been off the clock even. It could have been in the office by themselves, just the two of them. And he's attempting to have a heart-to-heart with a friend. But I mean, you reach a point of no return when you put friendship before business. The friendship has to be worth it. And if it isn't, it could be for a number of reasons. It's that you've outgrown the friendship. It's that the friendship wasn't meant to be professional. And so they're only friends. They're not associates, so to speak. They weren't meant to be business partners. I'm not saying, I mean, they are mutually exclusive, but they don't have to be exclusive, excluded from one another. You can go into business with friends and you can make friends through business. But it requires that much more care and analysis and consideration to be able to be neutral, to be able to be logical and not let friendship get in the way of business. All parties, both parties, because we're talking about two, both parties have to be aligned towards business so that the friendship continues to be harmonious in business. Because if the friendship is pulling in opposite directions, not in the direction of business, business falls apart and the friendship is liable to fall apart as well. And that's what happened in the case of my manager. After some time, he took the proper steps, the formal route to give him verbal warnings, written warnings, and ultimately had to terminate his own friend. Having been friends for years, since high school, worked together, made their bones together on the job. I don't know if the reason for the discord was one got promoted over the other, but I know my manager was a consummate professional and likely well-deserving of the promotion. Again, I wasn't there, so I don't know if they were more deserving than the friend. And it was only one position that they had to jockey for both, that they both had to jockey for, that they both had to compete for. And that's not to say that another position couldn't have opened up and they couldn't have tag teamed that one. So they could both be promoted in the future. Again, I wasn't there. I don't know. That's only the beginnings of office politics. That might be another sign of a toxic work environment. The office politics, the culture, how people get along. Who is the gossip? How news gets around? What kind of news? Is there a lot of fraternizing? Folks who go out a lot tend to share a lot. And then there's the drama that ensues. It's not so much a toxic work environment as it is a red flag. But if it metastasizes, if those problems 
they have to be problematic. If those problems metastasize across departments, it could cripple an entire operation. It could cripple an entire company. It could bring a company to a standstill. Over pettiness. That's why you don't go in trying to make friends. You want to make associates. Competent, capable people. And then you be friendly with them. You be considerate. You be polite. You don't have to be friends. Just be amicable. There's very few people I would stick my neck out for. And some of them I don't even consider friends. Let that sink in. Let's take a look at some of these comments real quick because I'm sure it'll be diverse in the sense that um, I'm sure it'll it'll be a, a diverse <clears throat> a diverse offering because it's such a general question and I'm sure folks are coming from different angles. I only gave a, a small handful, but I think those tend to stand out the most. If you're not getting paid well. Um, if the channels of communication aren't effective, right? Like if there's micromanaging, if and if the chain of command isn't competent, right? You you, you can just have inept managers who don't know how to manage, who can't lead, who cannot lead, and and just don't know what the fuck they are doing. The first comment here says condescending backhanded comments and micromanaging to start. I think that first one is oddly specific. Condescending backhanded comments. Yeah, that sounds more like just a toxic relationship. <laughs> um, there are some folks who utilize sarcasm and sarcasm as a tool. Very effective. I think if you're using it um, to give comments, it depends on how they sound condescending. Um, this person could just be sensitive to these to these type of comments that are sharp, sharp comments, comments that provide praise and also critical feedback, right? Condescending, backhanded comments. I, I, those are those are few. I mean, really parsing that phrase out. You come to learn that those type of comments might be the most professional, giving you some of the good with some of the bad, giving you your critical feedback, criticizing you, uh, providing criticism in a constructive manner. It could be heavy criticism, heavy handed criticism, but with a teaspoon of sugar to go with it. The next comment here says, I was in a position where I was asked to manage people, but had no authority to make decisions for my team. My opinions and inputs did not matter, and I was never included in any decision making. These were the signs. I was just told what to do, and if things went wrong, I was 100% to blame. Extremely condescending and an outright mean boss. That was my most toxic work environment. Again, again, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not understanding of what a condescending boss sounds like. Um, I think a lot of bosses are going to be in a position to talk down to their employees if they are outright mean. Okay, I get it. If they're just, if they just act outrageous, I get it. But condescending, I mean, extremely condescending. You've got to know how to communicate also back with the boss. You've got to be sharp, right? At the end of the day, you applied for this position. And besides giving them a spoonful of their medicine, of their own medicine, which they could easily terminate you for, you could parry and strike back some. But parry, okay? Don't just strike back because that's an emotional response. Don't just react. But you could parry. And uh, parlay. <laughs> That's if you want to move professionally, 
If you want to move like a corporate cowboy, you've got to learn how to deal with difficult people. It's easy to think, oh, uh, this person will get their comeuppance. But if the comeuppance isn't coming from you, then when the fuck are they going to get their comeuppance? Right? Now, I'm not saying you do it directly, right? You break their kneecaps or shoot them in the thigh. I'm not, I'm not saying any of that. What I am saying is that you can learn how to communicate. Your social skills can be honed to such a degree that these condescending or extremely condescending bosses become just another client in your mind. You treat them as another client, even if you are the employee. You're servicing the manager. You're keeping them satisfied. Not pleasuring them. No. Right? I'm trying to get your mind out of the gutter also. Two birds, one stone. We're not pleasuring the manager. Fuck how they feel. But we're satisfying our job. And we're keeping them in check. Yeah, and as far as being uh, undermined, I think, or, or, or being under uh, underpowered, not having the, not being given the appropriate authority, I think that also speaks volumes. Because that becomes an issue. That becomes an issue when you can't make the moves for your team, and yet you're expected to shoulder 100% of the burden, to be accountable for the success and the failure of your team when you can't or have no control of the team, of how the team operates. I find that to be very disingenuous on behalf of the, on behalf of the management, on behalf of the boss, on behalf of leadership. And you're pretty much sending, s- sending your, your general into battle with their hands tied behind their back. This is corporate war. You want weapons free. You want folks to be able to to have some degree of control, to be able to improvise in their own way as a manager, as a potential leader, to lead their team to success. Otherwise, you're really hamstringing your own team. Somebody else writes here, this third comment says, at my work, and in parentheses they put, I just put in my two weeks notice, people left meetings in tears. All right. I mean, I guess (laughs) it's kind of funny. Uh, That's kind of funny. But um, again, this might be one of those, this might be, I mean, these people could just be soft. Multiple people left in tears. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to skip that one. Multiple, really multiple people left in tears. Okay. Uh, Ooh, this next comment has a bunch of points on here. They're saying people crying on their breaks outside of the building made us do OT because of their bad management. Uh, The boss asking for feedback after finishing a project without accepting constructive criticism as an option. Okay. I mean, this just sounds like an inept boss, inept management, inept leadership. People crying on their breaks, I think that's, you know, that's what, that's idiosyncratic. That's what they do on their own free time. If they want to use their 10 or 15 minute break to go cry, they can do that, right? But they got to come back ready to work. <laughs> I don't know why I'm taking the boss's side right now, uh, except for the fact that they won't accept constructive criticism or they won't at least consider it, right? If they don't consider your constructive criticism and, and, and defeat it, right, then it's not worth asking for feedback. If I ask for feedback, it's because I want to see something constructive, right, something to consider. And then if it's decided that it's not constructive, it's not implemented. But if it's not, if, if it's not even looked at, why the fuck even ask for it? Um, PCs were named after their extravagant places they visited. 
uh, what is that? PCs, uh, PCs, PCs were named computers. I don't know. PCs were named after their extravagant places they visited. Uh, that and that's just weirdly written too. After their extra, or is it the after the extravagant places they visited, PCs, and and then it's PCs with an apostrophe. PC apostrophe S. What the fuck is that? Anyways, bad at keeping people to work for them. So, okay. So retention, retention was shitty. And the only two middle management positions were occupied by two people that left after one month slash six months. Yeah. Yeah. If, if retention is shit, you can imagine, especially middle management. If middle management retention is shit, if people are just cycling in like a, like a revolving door, Expect, expect the hierarchy from middle management up to also be just fraught with fucking corruption, to be fraught with drama. <laughs> Those are some of the best places to work in. They provide the best opportunity to just leverage your way up. If you are, if you are competent, if you are apt for corporate war, for what comes with the territory of being a corporate cowboy, operating with a cloak and a dagger, a little skullduggery, if you will. That that specific situation where middle management is just a revolving door, that's chef's kiss. That's prime real estate for moving up, for knocking out, for taking over. Uh, Next point, it says, listening to... P- listening to employee combos over the camera. I don't have proof, but I have a hunch that one of the bosses actually read my emails. No way. You mean to tell me that what you say at work and what you write over the work email is recorded is not yours? I'm actually on board with the uh, with the boss on this one. If it could be that the boss is wasting their time, right? If, like if they set up, if they specifically set up recording devices to try and catch, I don't know, um, traitors to try and out betrayal, to try to smoke out problem people. Um, it could be that the boss is just wasting their time, right? But again, that's the boss's time to waste. And if the boss wastes her time on anything that is not business related, then that's on them to take on whatever consequences come from that. Their business will suffer as a consequence. But, and I had this position before, I was in a management position and um, my employees were talking about, I don't know, like a fucking football game in the past. Uh, like the past weekend, a, f- a football game that took place and they're talking stats, they're projecting and forecasting what future games are going to look like, who's going to be where, who's going to do what, what, how's it going to go down. The whole time, mind you, we were working at a restaurant, right, at a, uh, at a quick service. It's a uh, Mexican grill, very popular for, for E. coli. After I left, I will disclaim, after I left, very popular with the E. coli variant. But before, um, they're they're talking about all this sports ball bullshit, right? And the reason I say just sports to me in general, sports is sports. I don't I don't watch it a whole lot. I don't follow it a whole lot. I know how to play most all of them. I was all sports when I was younger. Um, but this conversation is carrying on loudly. Loudly, just back and forth between the two of them standing next to each other and a customer or two customers standing in front of them that they, my employees, were meant to be servicing. Now, if this doesn't inspire any any feelings of, of not ill intent, I'm going to say, but any, any intent to discipline in a leader, in a manager – I don't know what will, but that's a waste. Like that, that wasn't a waste of time on my part to identify it and point it out and tell them verbatim to shut up and talk to the customer <laughs> because the customer is like, 
The customer is literally watching these two back and forth, their head movement and their eyes keeping up with the back and forth of what my employees are talking about. And my employees are not including the customer. The customer that they actually pause their conversation <clears throat> mid-sentence and ask the customer, would you like what, white or brown rice or black or pinto beans, right? And in between the customers making their options, they are carrying on a conversation between themselves, right? So what you say at work should be work-related. And if it ain't, include the fucking customer. Make the customer feel included. That's how you get good reviews. That's how you get return customers. Not, not just carrying on a conversation and the customer is just the third wheel. It's just an extra dick just chilling there. The customer is going to feel like, well, I don't know. Like these, these people aren't really personable. These people don't really care. I'm treated as just another number. They don't ask me if I want guacamole. They don't ask me if they don't ask me how my day is even going. They're inconsiderate. It's like they're not there to service me. It's like they're there. It's like they're there to collect a check. Now I get, I get, and I put myself in my employee shoes because I was exactly in my employee shoes. Where if the job isn't fun, I'm not having fun. Okay, I get it. You can make the job fun and at the same time develop your skills socially as a professional by including the customer. That's how you sell is including the customer. You include the customer, you enthuse them, you enthrall them into the sports game of the week. Ask them what their favorite team is. Throw a couple of stats around, maybe one or two playful deprecating jokes. Say, oh, well, my team is going to shit on your team playfully, right? Or give them a little confidence boost. Damn, yeah, your team is doing great this season. And the customer will be more than happy to add to, to add the extra expense of chips or a drink or something like that. Come back, leave us a tip because they felt included. And the tips are distributed. And I mean, the tips are important, right? Especially when you're on the line, when you're a low-level, entry-level employee. Making more than minimum wage, but you still got to make even more money to make ends meet, especially when you're living in a large metropolitan area where rent or the mortgages are insane. So why would you, why would you waste any time not hustling the customer? That was a rant, but I digress. The next point here is bragging about luxury items while paying your employees little above minimum wage. I was living paycheck to paycheck almost. I mean, sounds like you fucked up negotiating, plain and simple. Sounds like you fucked up negotiating. I Granted that bragging about material shit, any material shit, especially luxury items, bragging about any of that, just outright bragging. Like not if you're showcasing it for an employee like this is what they could get, but bragging about it, really rubbing it in their faces, I get it. It's shitty, but that could be fixed by you negotiating your worth you upping your skills, you do that personally. Don't, don't ask for everybody's minimum wage to go up because you will end up making relatively the same in respect to everybody else, in regards to everybody else. And your manager will, will be making the same too. How about you stand out and leave everybody else behind? That goes back to my supervisor, to my immediate Supervisor, the one I mentioned earlier, having to fire his friend. Why don't you stand out and get promoted? The friend, unfortunately, got left behind. Whether or not that really weighed on their conscience and just started dragging their feet and became an anchor to the company that they had to let go, that they had to be let go by their own friend. You know, that's not for me to say. Again, I wasn't there. But if somebody else is bragging, that should be motivating you to move to make moves, to be a corporate cowboy. Otherwise, start engaging in a little corporate war yourself. Damn. 
again, it, it depends on, on the type of job, the industry, the organizational hierarchy that you're at, the organization itself, whether or not it lends itself to that kind of treatment. If you need help, if you need help, a one-to-one, our quotes are reasonable. Our rate is reasonable. Shoot us a DM. We'll set something up. We'll set up a consultation. You can DM us on Instagram, actually, at Corporate Cowboys with a Z. The Corporate Cowboys podcast is also on Patreon. There are multiple tiers. The higher the tier, it gives you access to ask questions. Make them tailored. Make them specific so that our answer is informed and personalized to you, to your situation. Learn to write. Learn to write in such a specific manner while at the same time not just giving not just giving away personally identifiable information learn to write in such a in, in such a technical way in such a specific way i won't say technical write in a specific way that a professional giving their opinion can best give you an informed opinion the next point here says a really bad time Really, oh, really bad time and project management. No clear deadlines, but if they gave you one, it was unrealistic and God forbid you took too long. It's your fault. We are behind. <laughs> yeah, that's just, that's just uh, inept management. Um, those, uh, I, I wouldn't say a toxic work environment. I, I don't know. I, I feel like the notion of toxicity is dependent on the length of time you stay there and the length of time you put up with it. Because if it becomes a recurring pattern, yeah, it just becomes a toxic relationship. That's the whole point. It's something that is ongoing because you remain there. Regardless of whether or not you feel trapped, I think this goes back into personal relationships also. People leave. People leave and are better left with nothing than sticking around with something that draws a deficit on them, right? If somebody really was soul-sucking or if a job really was soul-sucking, wouldn't you rather not be there than have to show up and be like, oh, I'm feeling suicidal today? I've been, I've been in that position before. Where when I seen it, I left. Fuck all of that. I'm not going to let them hinder my development as a professional and definitely not be a burden on my mental health. But I get there are some people who who can't sustain themselves, who don't know how to live by themselves, who know little more, I'm going to be facetious here, who know little more than to tie their shoes and wipe their ass, but are scared to go some time without a job or are scared to be actively looking for a job because they feel trapped at their current position. That's, that's called being insecure. That, that requires self help to a level that I'm not, I may not be able to do so professionally. We may not be able to do so professionally. I say we may not because we could, if we address certain key points in their professional life. But if it's in their personal life, if they have clinical depression, I'm not saying that uh, hormonal imbalances don't exist, but that requires professional help. That requires professional medical help. That's not what we're providing. We're providing professional career help. So if you took too long, it's your fault. We are behind. Yeah, that person sounds like they've been in that in that shitstorm before. And then they stuck around to have it develop into a toxic work environment. Yeah, no, that's not that's not it. Um, no benefits whatsoever. What do you mean no benefits whatsoever? I feel like again, that goes back to you negotiating your compensation, knowing your worth. But I get if you're brand new, if you're a novice. And you haven't done any fucking research. You haven't done a lick of a lick of research before you apply to a position. 
Um, I mean, that's still kind of your fault. That's still kind of your fault. Research, 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 research before you jump in. Know what you're getting into. Investigate. You're doing reconnaissance before you're doing reconnaissance. This is corporate fucking war you're enlisting in. Whether you're an employee, an independent contractor, this is corporate war. I've been in it before. I'm in it now. You just have to realize it's what you're it's what you're born into. And the day you decide to play, the day you decide to get involved, to actually participate as a professional is the day you recognize how much you are worth. Not worth the workforce is worth. The workforce right now, like half of the workforce ain't worth is not worth minimum wage. But that's another episode. <laughs> uh, the next point here, if asking for a day off, be prepared to explain in detail why you need that day, even if it is personal. Yeah, you don't have to explain shit. Just ask for the day off. If you have paid time off, ask for the day and don't show up. <laughs> Let them know. They're managers. They're, they ought to, like, again, you have to realize your worth. In order for your worth to actually be respected, you must realize it. But don't expect your worth to be recognized if you're a shit employee, you've got a a shit attitude, and you tell them that you need a day off for what? For mental health? Because you've been shit all along? Come on. Come on. Humans are supposed to be the most resilient, one of the most resilient species. Why? Because we can also think and communicate, use logic. Use progressive logic and tact. But, I mean, apparently, apparently it fails people. Uh, somebody else says, made jokes about employee mental health. I'm, you don't see me, but I'm raising my hand right now. I've made jokes about employees' mental health. And I've kept them working. Why? Because I made them feel better. What happens outside of the workplace, you don't bring to the workplace. Like what you do for me on the job, I don't expect you to take home. I don't want you to take home. That's a fucking liability. So when you show up to work, you're working. That's why if you're on the, on the clock talking about personal bullshit to another employee, either you're including me or you're including the customer. You're including the client. Keep that personal bullshit for off the clock on your break. You can gossip and gab all you want. And this isn't towards any particular sex or gender. I give two fucks about what you identify as. But while you're on the clock, you identify as working. (laughs) Uh, Somebody else says, latest edit. I also remember they had interviews for my job while I had COVID. What's wrong with that? If you're out having COVID, maybe it dawned on them that they should have more than one person, somebody who could potentially fill you, your position on call if you're not available. Maybe they're going to have a full-time and a part-time to supplement you. Maybe they're going to have two part-times, right? In an ideal world, they would let you know, hey, when you come back, because of COVID and whatnot, we're going to have a part-time. We're going to have somebody else working alongside so that if you don't show up, they could be full-time. Or if they don't show up, you become full-time. That's idealistic. I get it. But at the same time, it's meant for the manager to be doing their job as a manager and looking out for business. Exactly like yourself. As an employee, you get you ought to be looking out for the business too. But if you get sick, there's only so much sick time or PTO that you can take, right? But if you're still out, still contagious, still can't get up to work, what well, they're just gonna wait for you, you're gonna feel <laughs> with, you're gonna feel offended, you're gonna be you're gonna feel disrespected that they're taking interviews. For a position you're not even currently filling? Come on. Give me a fucking break. Lastly, they say here, I don't think my former boss is here. So let me just say, fuck you. And then they named them. 
Yeah, I'm not gonna name them, but yeah. Um that person seems salty, seems kind of sour, seems like a fucking pawn, a peon, even worse than a pawn. Um Nah, I think a pawn is worse. How much time I got left? 45 minutes? Damn, y'all got a freebie for this one. I was about to go down a little rabbit hole. A little Google rabbit hole. Find the definition and the origin, the roots for pawn and peon. And find which one is worse. You know, this is the type of tangents that my mind goes off of. Goes off on. <laughs> Regardless, you want to find out, look it up. Research, investigate. You have to become sharp. You have to become unkillable. You have to sharpen yourself. You be the knife. You be the gun. You be the shank. If that's all you have, or if that's all you need, something quick, something dirty. <laughs> this is corporate war, baby. Know what you're getting into. I'll catch you around.